But the best part is you can keep doing this and keep focusing on my accent while we destroy your housing. We buy your land. We change your laws. We will go much, much deeper while you stick to this juvenile nonsense. Keep doing it, baby. I absolutely hate Toronto, and there was no looking back the day I decided to call it quits with that city, or any other city for that matter. But this week, I had the misfortune of having to go back. Silly little me, I thought it would be a quick trip. I thought I could go in there, get everything I needed done within an hour, and get back out. Funny how outside elements have a way of changing all that. It doesn't matter how much planning you put into it. When you go into a place like Toronto, you have no control. So today seems like as good a time as any to talk about Toronto as the canary in Canada's coal mine and what it could tell us about the direction we're going in. So we are going to talk about three things today. Unions and immigration, how Toronto ties those two things together. And as a sweet little bonus round, I'm going to introduce you guys to a personality, a Canadian personality on Twitter that I never knew about until this week. Spoiler alert, he's already blocked me, but man, this guy is hilarious. You got to check this out. We're going to cover that. So let's start with unions as they have far more of a negative impact on Canada's standard of living than most people even realize. If you want an added look at this, be sure to check out the link to the alcohol markups in Ontario as evidence of the extra price we as Canadians have to pay for everything, all because of public sector unions. For the longest time now, Toronto has been shutting down long parts of its subway lines on weekends to carry out necessary work. And it really is necessary. There are parts of these tunnels, and you won't believe this, but there are actually parts of these tunnels, for instance, that are still lined with asbestos. So yes, there's no denying that work needs to be done. But here is where need and logic hit a hard fork in the road. Toronto, our largest city, the economic heart of the country, is frequently touted as a world-class city. What kind of world-class city forces its citizens off the subway and tries to pack them like sardines onto shuttle buses and adds an extra hour of travel time to their itineraries? In the middle of summer, during peak tourist season, I'll tell you who. It's a gutless government that is too afraid to put on its big boy pants and tell the TTC union it wants those workers to carry out this work at night. If the city took this approach, workers would have an automatic 32 hours of week of labor time, which is more than what shutting down for the weekend gives them. Yet another case of how a small group of people, in this case the TTC workers, get to have their interests serve over the needs of the majority. Speaking of how smaller groups take up more space than the majority, let's talk about the surface level behavior. And I'm talking about the surface above the TTC. This is where I had the misfortune of noticing a very profound change in the way Canadians are behaving. You see, while I was waiting for a shuttle bus, I observed that most people were ready to patiently wait in line for their turn to get on the bus. And by the way, it needs to be kept in mind that a fresh, empty shuttle bus keeps popping up every three minutes. Now, I'm not a very patient guy, but three minutes, even I can handle that. That's not a big deal. So when the next shuttle bus comes along, the one that I'm standing in line for patiently with the others, a few, let's just say, non-Canadians made a point of not only cutting through line, but trying to plow through the current of people trying to exit the bus. This is where the big change is coming in. When people who patiently waited their turn start noticing this and realize they're going to lose the seats they were patiently waiting for, they start getting aggressive and doing just like the others. This is where we're going to start to see a change. They weren't doing it because they're selfish or entitled. They're doing this because now they realize they have to fight for what they always had in the first place, which is ridiculous. This should be considered very disturbing. This is not what I want to see of Canadians. I don't want to see them engaging in that kind of behavior. It's ridiculous and it's as individualistic as behavior gets. So those are the two big acid tests going on in Toronto right now that that shows us the direction the whole country is pretty much going in. So let's move on to something a little lighter. Have you guys ever come across a dude named Amir Adaran on Twitter? Like I mentioned, I'm blocked, so whatever, I can't see, but this guy is the poster child for unhinged leftists on social media. 
If you haven't come across his profile yet, you're missing out, but you're going to have to be careful how you interact with him because I, I, I did, it didn't take much to get me blocked. I really didn't say anything overly offensive at all, but the unhinged nature of his tweets are truly next level and you'll come away with some of the best laughs you've had in a while. Just one of the classics that he's responsible includes having his students recognize his pronouns as Lord and Maple Leaf. Now, as much as I'm a post this guy, I have to say that as someone who enjoys a good laugh i thought this was hilarious i actually think him doing this is hilarious but from what i understand from what i've been told he's taking this seriously he actually takes this seriously if you're doing that just to troll people that is absolutely hilarious but i don't know what's more hilarious the fact that he takes himself seriously doing this or that he's trolling people i don't know and it gets better know how one thing can sometimes get blown completely out of proportion and take on a life of its own well apparently amir made the mistake of complaining to his students that the interest rate he pays on a waterbed that he bought on credit was way too high. So he's here, <laughs> he's here teaching classes and bitching about the fact that he's paying a 25% interest rate on a waterbed. So this griping though would come back to haunt him. <laughs> It would come back to haunt them because someone went and altered the Wikipedia page about him and put in a claim that Amir had refinanced this waterbed and failed to make payments on it and therefore the waterbed was repossessed. You will no longer find this on Wikipedia. They managed to scrub it. But it's if you look around, especially if you look up Amir on Rate My Prof, you'll see many mentions of this. You'll also find many mentions of it on Reddit. But this is absolutely hilarious and it just goes to show that you know some even some of the most innocuous things you say can come back to haunt you like he says plenty of god-awful things but it's him whining about his waterbed financing that came back to really haunt him so you kind of figure that someone as prolifically problematic as amir would find himself in a doghouse with his employer the university of ottawa wouldn't you you'd figure there'd be a limit as to how much this guy could get away with right well check out this footage of amir dropping a very public public deuce on his employer's head. The University of Ottawa has a systemic racism problem for certain. I'm disappointed that my institution fails constitutional and human rights law. They clearly think that they have the authority to demand identification that others must provide it. Um, they're highly ignorant about the law and they're using it against people of color. And if the administration of this university would like to attend its own law school where I teach, this can easily be explained. So just so you know, that was five years ago. Think of how many unhinged tweets Amir could fire off in that time and the University of Ottawa hasn't done anything about it. It also bears mentioning that he also sued the University of Ottawa for denying him a Canada research chair based on his race. All this and he still has not been fired. This totally explains why he is such an arrogant, self-aggrandizing prick. Like no one's going to stop him. You can't blame the this guy for being the way he is because no one is putting their foot down. No one is putting him in his place. So of course he's going to keep doing that. I mean, even Twitter has shown more backbone than any of Canada's universities. In 2021, they suspended Amir's account after he stated that Justin Trudeau should be tarred and feathered. Anyone doing what Amir's doing in the private sector would have been on the receiving end a long time ago. I hope this has been both enlightening and entertaining at the same time. If you've got anything to say about Toronto as our canary in the coal mine, or if you want to share any laughs about Amir, please feel free to do so in the comments. Thank you very much for watching. And if you haven't done so already, please consider subscribing.